Hi everyone. Uh, why don't we Why don't we kick off? Uh, my name is Mark Entwistle, and it's uh, a pleasure to be introducing today's webinar. Uh, this This is a special one for me, as I'm I'm both the principal at Oliver Wyman, based out of Hong Kong, uh, and a founding board member of the FinTech Association of Hong Kong, who are uh, collaborate, collaborating uh, both collaborating today to to bring you this this webinar. Uh, so we'll be providing some information on this year's. Uh, Global Fintech Accelerator from, uh, from MAPS, the uh, Monetary Authority of Singapore. Uh, and that's organized and run by my old wine colleagues in Singapore, uh, who you will be uh, speaking to shortly. Uh, and we'll also be treated to a fireside chat uh, on the topic of, topic of green finance, uh, which is uh, this, year's, uh, this year's theme. So we'll be hearing from Helene Lee, who many of you, uh, if you're Hong Kong based, will be familiar with. Uh, Helene serves as the general, general manager of our FinTech Association, uh, as well as being a senior financial services figure uh, within Hong Kong and co-founder of uh, Go Impact, uh, which, is, um, which has a, a focus on sustainable development. So very relevant for today's discussion. And speaking with Helene will be Tech Yu, uh, who is uh, chair of the Green and Sustainability Subcommittee uh, at the Singapore FinTech Association. So another fantastic collaboration for us here today uh, on this theme. Uh, and TechU is also Vice Chairman of Old Wine in Singapore. So, so a great mix, great mix of people. Uh, I'm gonna hand over now to, uh, to Ben, Ben Bolsa, who will be uh, taking you through uh, the details on our, uh, on our accelerator initiative uh, for this year. Ben is a, a partner at Old Wine based in Singapore. Over to you, Ben. Thank you, Mark. Um, hello, everyone. Good to, to uh, have the chance to speak to you about the accelerator today. Can I just check? Can you see my screen? Maybe, Mark, you can just let me know. Yes, I can. Thank you. Perfect. Excellent. Good. So, uh, as Mark said, um, we are, we're running this year the FinTech Accelerator with the MAS out of Singapore. Um, it's, a, it's a very high profile flagship event for those of you that are in the fintech scene. You know that this has been running for the last six years, every year with a slightly different flavor. And it's always highly awaited and culminates at the Singapore Fintech Festival um, in November. And it's going to be the case as well this year. So I will take you through this over the next five or 10 minutes. Just to give you a bit of context, what's the fintech accelerator? What's the focus this year? What's the process? How can you participate? What's in it for you? What can be the next steps? Um, and then happy to take any questions later on, but also through the chat or Q&A function. So the FinTech Accelerator this year is focused on green, anything green finance and green FinTech. And the reason for that is, I think, to most of us pretty obvious. If we look around ourselves, what's happening, the topic of sustainability, in particular green finance, green FinTech is really accelerating. If you look at just what's happening in Asia with a few examples here on this page, you see a lot of activity around green bonds in virtually most of the markets. You see the regulators stepping in and incentivizing the development. You see a lot of private market participation happening um, in other instances. Um, and generally there's a, there's a huge tailwind behind this. And the industry has recognized the green sustainability problem is something that needs to be tackled from, from all angles. And in this context, it was decided that this year's FinTech Accelerator will focus purely on green finance and green FinTech. In prior years, the topics um, were a bit broader. Last year was focused on sustainability. This year, it's gotten even more narrow to be more specific, to address more very concrete, specific problems. And we're looking for FinTechs from all around the world to join and participate. So what is the Accelerator? It's, it's an acceleration program or an innovation competition that is looking for innovative market ready solutions that can really solve some of these big problems we are grappling with. As I said, the idea here is to focus on green finance um, and it's a competition through which we're trying to identify up to 50 finalists um, which will participate in an acceleration program over the course of um, August, September, and October. Um, and get developed. Uh, we will work with them, mentor them, coach them in order for them to present at the Singapore FinTech Festival um, and showcase their solutions to, to the world, essentially. There's a lot of it on this page that you can see here. There's a lot to offer. There are cash stipends on there. There's mentorship by corporate um, champions. Um, 
investors will play a major role. So we're trying to get all the fintechs exposure to potential venture capital funds and other investors who may want to participate and help those fintechs. There are many interesting and very um, significant grants available for the winners here. So we hope this is a very compelling um, proposition that allows many fintechs in early stages of their development to, to turbocharge um, their, their trajectory. Now, in order to identify some problem statements that these fintechs can address, we went around the industry in Singapore and the region and we interviewed the banks, the insurance companies, the asset managers, the exchanges, um, many other corporates as well. And we asked them, what are some of the real world problems that you would like to be solved, that you don't think are being addressed today and where fintechs could play a role? And we have structured these into three buckets. One bucket that's around mobilizing capital making capital flow from the sources of capital for investors to the, to the projects or anything else that has a green angle that needs financing. Solutions that take the friction out of that, solutions that help with the matchmaking, et cetera. The second pillar is around monitoring the commitment. One thing that we are very cognizant of is that just mobilizing the capital loan is not enough. You need to make sure that the commitments that are being made from the borrowers or from the projects that are being developed to the investors are being, um, being honored and therefore there's a monitoring element around that. And finally, the third pillar is all about measuring that impact because if the first two fall in line, we really want to make sure that the capital flows to those areas that can really um, move the needle and, and have an impact on the problems. So we've come up with more than 50 problem statements all backed by corporates and financial institutions in the region. They're all on the website, so you can look them up there. And the idea is that fintechs apply specifically to any of those um, problem statements or multiple of those and say, we believe we have something that it takes, we can address this uh, particular problem and we would be part of the fintech accelerator. So what's in it for the participants? Quite, quite a few interesting elements. There is mentorship. So we will have every finalist matched with a corporate champion. And that champion is going to be working very closely with the fintech um, over the coming months. Um, you see some of the logos here from previous years. This year it's going to look very similar, but we're still finalizing it. The idea is that each corporate champion that we match a fintech with has actually come up with a problem statement that that fintech was selected for. So there's a true business interest to do something and make something meaningful happen here. Deal Fridays talks about the investor facing element that we're trying to create. And we're really trying to create a forum for the fintechs to get exposure to investors, help them to get in front of these, help refine their pitch in an ideal world, of course, get funded down the line. And then a lot of other benefits around it, global exposure. The, the fintech festival in Singapore um, in November this year is obviously a huge stage that gives a fantastic opportunity for fintechs to um, publicize themselves and, and show themselves to the world. I mentioned the grants a little bit earlier. You can see here again, and many other benefits that are lined up to be um, essentially rewards and incentives for you to participate. Now, this FinTech Accelerator program obviously is only a means to an end. We want to use this as a starting point and find future champions, future businesses that can scale and become successful. So we thought we pulled out a few examples here from the last few years. Um, so these range from 2017 to 2019. And these were all companies that participated in earlier editions of the FinTech Accelerator. Some of them were under different and broader themes, so not focused on green or sustainability. And what's interesting to see is all of these examples here have raised funds, subsequently have completed the Series A and are beginning to get onto the journey of scaling from here. So this is a huge testimony to the success that this program can have and what we hope future participants of the FinTech Accelerator program We'll go on to follow and, and follow a similar journey. So let's talk a little bit about where we are in the process and how does it work. So we have opened the applications for the accelerator in May. Um, the application deadline is now the 4th of July. So you have a few more weeks left. Um, you need to apply on the APEX platform. I'll come to that in a second and essentially register and put in your proposal or multiple proposals for different problem statements. We are then moving on to a judging round once the application deadline has closed. During that judging round, which will take place in July into early August, 
we are assembling a panel of um, industry executives, investors, and, and many other stakeholders, many of which have provided the problem statements to review the applications and together with us shortlist the 15 finalists that we will then join or invite to join the accelerator workshop. The finalists will then be confirmed in August and we move into that 10 to 12 week acceleration program through multiple workshops where we'll be working with you as finalists on helping you get ready and, and improve your proposition, work with the corporate champions all the way in the run up to essentially the FinTech festival and uh, the big reveal is going to be the presentation at the demo day when you will have your chance to pitch. Um, then the winners for out of the 15 finalists will be selected, will be announced, prizes will be awarded and so on. So in order to participate, um, a few things. First of all, you need to register. Um, you can scan the QR code here on the right hand side or click on any of the links um, or simply Google FinTech Accelerator 2021. Um, in principle, any fintech can register. I think we are looking for companies that have some form of market ready solution. So we're not looking for concepts or ideas or business plans, but we're looking for companies that have something that in a relatively near term can be ready, can be taken to market. I think it's important to point out while we keep mentioning fintechs, we're also looking for companies that may not identify as a fintech today, but companies that are in the AI space or in the robotics space or in any other industry have capabilities that think are transferable to some of the problem statements um, that we have outlined. The application process is relatively simple. You create your account, a few details on the organization so we know who you are. Then you can work on your proposal on the Apex platform. And this proposal essentially is a pitch. So if you have pitched ever to an investor or pitched a business plan, it's very similar of what, what we would like to see. So obviously tell us about your company, tell us the problem statement you're addressing, tell us why you're well suited to do it, what milestones you have achieved, what the team is like, what proprietary technology you have, if any, and su support or submit any supporting documents that, that you want, either pitch decks, videos, demos, anything really that you think makes your case, right? So be creative, don't hold back. This is your one chance to, to impress us. There will not be any back and forth during this application process. So what you submit here is what we will use to evaluate you, to invite you into the next stage. And then the judging criteria, are a few elements. First and foremost, you're gonna be looking at how relevant is what you have put forward to the problem statements? That's what we set out to solve. And that's what we're going to be keeping very focused on. We're going to be then be looking at the business potential, the inno innovativeness of the idea that you've come forward, but also the company profile and to the extent that we believe you're able to execute. So the track record you have, the team, the commitment to the idea, etc. So with that, I think I will wrap up this part of the presentation here, I hope this gave everyone um, a decent overview of what the Hexerator is all about. Um, I will now hand over to my colleagues, Helen and Tech Yu, who Mark has already introduced, so I won't repeat that. In the meantime, if any of you have questions on what I spoke about, feel free to put them into the chat or the Q&A function, and we'll pick them up in a joint Q&A after the fireside chat. Thank you, Tech Yu, Helen, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Mark, for the intro. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to this conversation. So we had a chat, I had a chat with Helen a week ago, right? And I think I think it was so clear that we can work together in this space. That is one global problem that we can solve, you know, by putting collective minds, collective brains together. So maybe as a background, let me let me just talk a little bit about what we have been doing in Singapore with the Singapore FinTech Association. Right, and I just start with that and, and see how, you know, some of the programs that you might be having in Hong Kong might tie into some of it. So when we started the FinTech Association's subcommittee on this, uh, we started in anticipation of, well, actually we started after MES has announced their, in, um, you know, their Green Pin initiative last December, right, where they said that they really want to mobilize green finance, right, in, in, in the way we mentioned, right, how you actually mobilize the capital, how you actually monitor the commitments and so forth. So that was announced by MES in December in the last FinTech Festival. Um, but we were also um, 
working at that point on the bigger Green Plan 2030, the, the, the whole of government Green Plan 2030, which we knew was going to be announced in, in, uh, in March this year. <clears throat> right, so tying the two together, we said, you know, if we have to find a way to get some focus among the fintech community to see how we can play in this game. Right? And the whole thing is not because we have to comply, but because we see an opportunity for fintechs to actually bring their capabilities, right? their problem-solving ability, their technology, the can-do attitude, right? to actually solve problems. Um, and, and that's the, 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 you know, the background of fintechs. Right? We have solved problems for you know, financial inclusion. We have solved problems for you know, uh, making micro-loans, micro-insurance. Right, we have disintermediated <coughs> centralized communities, right, with, with, with decentralized finance, whether it's through blockchain or others. So we are good at solving this problem. So the idea is how do we make this <coughs> transfer transferable into the green fintech space? So we set up this from community. I was delighted that when we actually plan it and we actually ask for you know people to nominate themselves to be part of this community. Com uh, this, this subcommittee, we are close to 40 people putting up their hands, right? Literally within a week, you know, 40 of them wanted to join this subcommittee, right? We settled on eight of us, right? With me being the, 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 the I guess, inaugural chair. And, and in there, we then decided on a couple of things. We, we felt that we had to make sure that fintechs get this idea, right? That it, they are an important part of the, of the program. So we wanted to do uh, one, educate the fintechs, two, even certify fintechs, right? Certify fintechs to say that these are green fintechs. And the reason for doing that was that we also anticipate that over time, all the large multinationals will only want to work with suppliers who are certified green, right? And fintechs are partnering with some of these bigger banks or insurance companies or even with non-FIs will find that they will be asked to demonstrate why they are green, right? And why they're qualified. So we wanted to do this green tech certification. <clears throat> we then also wanted to make sure that we mobilize the youth, right? So young people who we think, you know, obviously a green future is meant for the future, right? For the future generations. So we came up with a program with the Poly FinTech 100. Right, which is the five polytechnics in Singapore coming together to do a fintech hackathon with us, focusing on green, right? So for them, it's like, you know, how do we gamify? How do we actually do things to make sure that, you know, people as young as 19, even before they come out into the workforce, already start thinking about how they can contribute to the green journey, right? So we are tackling everything from the, 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 our own fintechs, the SME community, as well as the, you know, the youth community. And we'll try to run as many of these programs as possible. And I think one of these that's clearly on the table now is the Green FinTech Accelerator with MES, right? And for this, we were very clear that it is not about Singapore FinTechs. It's about getting the best in the world to participate in this and bringing all these ideas from anywhere in the world, right? To make sure that we can collectively solve this big problem. Right, I think we can talk about problems later on. But Helene, is, does this resonate with what you are doing in Hong Kong as well? Oh, abs absolutely, thank you. In fact, um, I'd like to just, you know, add on two different perspectives from where we are, you know, focusing a bit more on North Asia, maybe. So wearing my FinTech Association hat, although we don't have a formal sustainability committee, but we have a ESG working task force that has been putting out a lot of regular uh, sessions, looping in the fintechs, financial institutions, and other stakeholders. <clears throat> and there has been a series that really was, you know, very well received. Um, so that's on the on on the fintech side, and also uh, through the two our two strategic partners, the Science and Technology Park in Hong Kong, as well as the Cyberport in Hong Kong where they have a lot of incubates and startups within their community that are working on green tech. You know, the different uh, problem statements, as Ben was saying before, the three categories of problem statements. Uh, there are incubates that are working on that across the Hong Kong Science and Technology Park, as well as Cyberport. 
so there's quite a vibrant uh, thing going on, and I'm pretty sure that the FinTech Association will be looking at setting up a sustainability committee uh, shortly. Um, so wearing my other hat, the advocacy hat of Go Impact and the investor education hat of Go Impact, uh, we do agree that there is a lot of work you know, left on the table for everyone collectively. Um, to enable people to be on a, on a common playing field in a way, um, to, to ensure that people understand and can, you know, like democratize the way the access uh, to this. And I think FinTech plays an extremely important role. I was recently in a discussion with the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, as well as the Hong Kong Exchange. They are all looking at ways in which uh, a, a, an intersectional lens you know, can be can be applied to this because this is not just a, a problem that the finance industry can resolve. This is not just a problem that the government uh, can do entirely on their own. It's really through that intersectional lens uh, that we, we 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 can actually stand a chance to resolve these issues against the 17 sustainable development goals, you know, with a vision to achieve by 2030, which unfortunately I don't think we are very near. Um, you know, uh, getting there yet. So that's a bit of a backdrop here. And of course we have, a, a, you know, Hong Kong and Singapore in a way are similar. We are an island, both of us are an island, but with um, a, a big powerful neighbor, you know, uh, um, uh, and surrounded by, you know, so I think it's actually, um, you know, we play the role of connector. You know, we are a big connector. We are both, uh, you know, very major financial centers and will continue to be. Uh, and I think those are very unique advantages mm -hmm. to both locations for driving uh, sustainable investments and green tech. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, if you look at it, not a day passes without some announcement on, you know, decarbonization, climate change, right, initiatives and put in. I think one of the recent ones that really caught my attention was a survey of the large multinationals revealed that 80% of multinationals have indicated that they will strike off suppliers that are non-compliant. Right? So I think that strikes a bit of fear into, into, into our blood where, you know, you look at, at Asia, right? We are essentially suppliers to the West. In many many areas, right? Whether it is in, you know, garments or you know, even as much as semiconductors, you know, uh, advanced manufacturing, whatever it be, right? We are a very big export-oriented region, and I think if we don't get the community, you know, engaged in this, we will actually lose out a lot in our export revenues in the next few years, right? So while I see large announcements around how government is doing certain things you know, the master investing into a big, you know, $1.2 billion decarbonization fund. We look at, uh, you know, the, the, the climate impact exchange set up in Singapore by the SGX and, 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 uh, and, and Stan Chan and Tomase. And I said, all that seems to always gear, be geared towards the large companies, those that will actually move the needle, right, at a global level or even at a country level. What we wanted our fintechs to start thinking about is how do we make sure that the underserved, right, the SMEs, the smaller companies, you know, right, are not left behind, because those are the ones that you know will most likely find harder to go green, right? One because of understanding, two because of funding, right? Three, you know, a lot a lot of times when I talk to SMEs, they say, you know, our margins are so low, right? We are just coming out of the COVID. You know, we can't, we don't have money to invest in changing some of these things, right? So I think this is where I see again, you know, the role of fintechs in actually changing business models, helping all these smaller companies, right? You know, and taking some of the, the, the capabilities, whether it's in data, you know, blockchain, right? IoT, how do we actually bring them to play? And I think that's the big challenge that we have over the next two or three years. Right, and I think I'm hoping that we you know, we learn from from uh, you know Hong Kong, China, which is obviously bigger than us in Singapore, and have been a lot more advanced in the in, in fintechs. Right, I mean, the fact that you know the payments, cryptocurrency, everything else is going to be left on China now, right, and, and obviously impacting South China with, with with your teams there. 
So I, I'm, I'm keen to, to get a view, right, as to whether, you know, your, your SME community feels the same, feels like they need help in, in order to move along. Absolutely, thank you. I think uh, you hit the nail on the head in that SME is really an undertapped and underserved sector by the finance industry. And, you know, um, most of the businesses actually in both Hong Kong and Singapore are SMEs, the majority of them. So I think there are two perspectives here. One, for the big boys, you know, the big corporations, uh, it's really the, the, the tailwind behind the regulators and the whole global momentum, it becomes, it's no longer a nice to have, you know, going green or sustainability, it's a must have. If you look at the two big pieces of news recently, Chevron and uh, ExxonMobil, the two oil giants, both had like a board revolt that activist funds were voted mm. onto their board that keep were pointing their finger at your decarbonization plan just isn't good enough. And I'm going to, I will have a seat at your board and I am going to see that your decarbonization plan goes through. So it's a bad day for big oil in a way, but it's, there's also another perspective, like, you know, one of the biggest fund managers uh, out of the UK, uh, LG, LGIM, Legal General Investment, yes. they divest completely of AIG. Yes. The reason why they divest of AIG of all their funds, okay, it's not just one fund, all their funds across the board of LGIM. One pure, simple reason. They've been talking with them since 2018 about decarbonization and managing the carbon footprint, and they are not happy about it, okay? The, the response and the actions being taken. So I think now it's all about taking action. It's no longer good enough that you have a chapter of three pages in your annual report that talks about sustainability. <coughs> People need to see what action is being put behind it. What are the initiatives? How do you track it? Mm -hmm. How do you monitor it? And I think SMEs are very well positioned uh, to try to deepen um, that actionable kind of curve that we need to move on in order to make it happen. Uh, some of the virtual banks that are focusing on um, you know, SME lending, I think also helps uh, to drive, you know, to bridge some of that gap. But mm -hmm. honestly, I think it's really a, 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 a public and private sector partnership, like an MAS, as well as Hong Kong MA, um, they have uh, green, <coughs> green loans, you know, the, the, the grants, yep. particularly for people that, that uh, you know, are into the green finance area. And I think these are really welcomed initiatives, uh, you know, and like the accelerator as well, most welcomed initiatives that helps the startups and SME sector that really has been underserved in this. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think it's interesting that um, we all rely a lot on the government to push certain things, giving us grants, trying to come up with a data taxonomy on ESG that, you know, all the banks can follow and therefore be consistent in how they, you know, evaluate the, 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 the borrowers. And, and I think one of the, the, the challenges that have come from that was that every country is coming up with their version of taxonomy. All right, and therefore, you know, you just think about Hong Kong and Singapore, where like you say we are, we are small islands, but with big capital, right? And the capital can be deployed cross border. But if you have a Singapore bank or Hong Kong bank, you know, sort of using the Singapore taxonomy, and then investing in a project in Indonesia or in China, where the taxonomy is different, you will find it quite hard you know, for you to do, you know, the, the, the measuring of the impact, right, and the monitoring of the commitment. So I think these are the problem statements that are coming up in the, in the large scale level, right? So when we talk to banks, that's what the banks are saying, right? We are worried that while we can mobilize capital because at the point of application for a loan or for a bond, right, the corporates will, will, will satisfy all the checklists. But once the money is out, how do I monitor it? Right, how do I measure the impact? Right, and that's where I hope you know fintechs that have actually done a lot of work in data, right, where they've used alternative data for credit, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, for credit portfolios, for credit monitoring, right, as well as lending. How can we apply the same thinking into ESG data? Right, and, and I'm hoping again that <coughs> because China, Hong Kong is not buying it this whole micro lending space from peer-to-peer -peer lending right, to uh, you know, merchant-based lending, 
that thinking right can be applied here, right? And we are again looking to see how we can pull that sort of talent into this space. Absolutely. I think there are a, a couple of choke points. I keep calling them choke points because mm -hmm. they are not showstoppers. I don't believe that any of these are, should be showstoppers, but they, but people are getting stuck along this journey. So they are choke points. One of them is data, obviously. And as you said, alternative, alternative data uh, that can be used to validate, uh, you know, the extent of the impact uh, on E, S, or G of the investments. The other one is really a, a kind of standardization, a kind of common language. Like if I invest in equity, I know what the MSCI index looks like. And if you say you outperform MSCI by X percent, uh, I know exactly what I'm in for, you know, um, the, the kind of benchmark. But there isn't such a thing when it comes to an ESG, you know, kind of portfolio. I know there are, you know, um, initiatives being made uh, currently. Uh, you know, such as in the IFRS, the International Financial Reporting Standards Board is looking at setting up a sustainability standards board. And we have actually responded with a white paper on that. But it's still early days of that. Mm -hmm. And I think some of these choke points uh, can be addressed if, you know, with if fintechs as well as some of the big techs, you know, can, can come together. Like, for instance, in Hong Kong, I know there are a few fintechs that are working on this, uh, you know, alternative data to drive that. I know in China, there is a very big um, um, virtual bank that is also work, working on that. Uh, so I think these are very promising because with AI and big data, uh, some of these choke points can be, can, can be addressed. It's not like it's impossible. Yeah. I think the dream is to have a something like a credit bureau, right? That collects credit data, but in this case collects ESG data, you know, provides benchmarks, right? So that people can know that by doing this, this is the type of savings that we likely would get. Right. So, so I think I think the other thing is also the fact that we see a lot of opportunities for for hubs like Hong Kong and Singapore to not just be you know, looking at financing projects outside, you know, in our neighborhood, but also being the incubation and innovation centers for this, right? Because, you know, clearly, clearly, this is a financial services play and we are financial services hubs, right? So we want to see how we can leverage on that, right? Whether it is in the capital market side for bonds, right? Or, or you know, carbon trading, or in the lending side, or in really even ESG derivatives. And how do we take that sort of things into, you know, the markets where where we which which actually need it, right? So while we talk about China's BRI, we now talk about the B seven build a better scheme, right? All of which one, you know, are intended to build rebuild infrastructure, but making this new infrastructure as green as possible, right? There are so many opportunities out there where I think you know banks insurance companies, asset management, right, asset managers can all play a role, right? And they're all waiting for, you know, the choke points to be to be removed, right? And I think it will not be something done in isolation and something that's to be done in collaboration, right? The more brains, the better, whether it's, you know, the, the academia, whether it is, you know, the big tech, whether it's the stakeholders, the users of all this coming together. And that's why for the fintech festival, for the fintech accelerator this year, we went not just to banks to ask for problem statements. We also went to the large corporates, right? People who are going to be the users, right? Mm -hmm. People who want to transition to green themselves. And that's why I think when we run this program this year, our mentors will also include some of these corporates, right? So we are not we are not just saying that oh this is a banking problem. We want to make sure that the demand and supply are both you know, in the room, right? Together with the regulators, together with us, together with fintechs as the innovators. And hopefully collectively we'll come up with, you know, 10, 10 to 15 really good solutions, right? All of which, even if it might not be the top three, we actually end up as winners, right? So, so for us, historically, when you make it the top 15, you are a finalist, right? As a finalist, you already get a lot of credit, right? You don't even need to be the top three. Right? And I think there's so much, so much demand for this sort of innovation that, and I'm really looking forward to that. And I hope that there'll be Hong Kong fintechs that will, that will apply, right, and be part of this journey. 
Yes, actually, we are doing quite a bit to to make sure that you know in our community we are rallying them, bringing that to to their attention. And I believe there were quite a few Hong Kong based fintechs, although they also have offices in Singapore, obviously, and and other areas. But they seem to have a base out of here that have done very well uh, yep. in the accelerators before. Uh, so yep. I, I'm actually you know very um, optimistic yep. about the participation in this, and also given the huge momentum. That green finance has, you know, yep. uh, in both Singapore and Hong Kong, uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of, um, you know, players, uh, you know, they could be listening uh, right now uh, to this. Uh, that will be, you know, that should be and will be uh, participating in this. The interesting thing is, Tech you, I think, you know, uh, it's, um, you know, we have actually made the space quite a bit complicated through all the acronyms that we have, you know, created. Imagine. It's <laughs> like, you know, uh, we, we've coined more acronyms than we can even remember ourselves. And that, you know, creates a, a, a sense that people say, oh, I, I don't really know how to get in. Where do I start? And so on. And that the taxonomy is one thing. You know, EU has a taxonomy. Mm -hmm. Singapore is working on a taxonomy. But ultimately, you know, the, the 17 SDGs are like the, the framework the mm. broadest framework in which we, we are looking at things, whether it be climate, it be energy transition, <coughs> it be health, it be inclusion and biodiversity. Yeah. And out of that, I want to highlight supply chain as a very crucial point. Mm -hmm. Because supply chain, if you look at it, the eight supply chains in the world actually accounts for 85% plus of the carbon emissions. Mm. Um, so if we can tackle a, a more sustainable approach in the supply chain, again, through an intersectional lens, mm. uh, we stand a very good chance of reducing it, uh, you know, the carbon footprint and a big move, you know, towards decarbonization. But I think that calls for a lot of investor and e executive education along the way. People are just not aware of all the facts uh, and information out there, You're right? So, yeah, and, and I, think, I think you're right, right? I mean, the... the, the the broader ESG program has got many elements. Uh, <clears throat> the green finance is something that we are focusing on, right? Particularly on climate and carbon. So trade will, you know, trade, the trade routes will be a very important piece for many reasons, right? One is obviously, you know, the the the, the carbon emissions from ships, from, from airlines, cargo, and all those things. So moving moving supply chain closer to consumers. Right, so manufacturers must be being shortened. All these things are important initiatives that we need to think about. Right, if you look at some of the trade finance, you know, going paperless. Right, the 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 reduction in paper itself takes carbon out of the system. So I think there are lots of opportunities to, to make sure we do that. But also, if you look at the the same uh, report about eighty percent MNCs looking at their suppliers, that's where the whole supply chain and value chain comes in. Right, so if you as a supplier to a big multinational, for you to assure the multinational that you are green, you have to make sure that your own supplier is green and they have to make sure that their supplier is green, right? So the whole value chain has to be somewhat traceable, right? And I think that's again something that fintechs using blockchain technology have really mastered, right? And the question then is, you know, beyond taking on a digital invoice, digital trade documents, can I also get digital ESG documentation into the blockchain, right? So it certifies everything along the way. So I think I'm, I'm almost giving, you know, some, some uh, potential solutions out there right, for the fintechs to work on, right? But I think this is, again, what we're trying to say. Sometimes some of the fintechs don't see themselves as green because they're focusing very much on the, you know, trade finance provenance, but it's a little more, half a step more for them to do to actually make them green, right? So I see a lot of opportunity. I don't see this as a huge hurdle. Like you say, it's like the choke point, right? But I just see a lot of opportunities to remove those choke points quickly, right? Mm -hmm. And not wait for, you know, compliance to, to kick in, right? It's not, it's not because somebody said, if you don't do it, you know, you won't qualify, right? But I just see this as a huge opportunity to be ahead of the game. A hundred percent. I think there's a carrot and a stick. The com uh, you know, the compliance and regulatory requirements are the stick, definitely. So in terms yeah. of more stringent disclosure for listed companies, the, 
you know, and also for the funds for what is underlying in the ESG. <coughs> That's the stake that you know uh, people are awakening up to the fact that it's not just a tick in the box uh, kind of exercise. Uh, but there's also the carrot in that we are faced with these huge issues, but they also represent huge opportunities in terms mm -hmm. of business, in terms of investments. And uh, I, for one, I, I, I don't really buy the, the thing that, you know, it's a trade-off. You, you either have to do good or you do well with your investments. Yep. Yep. If you invest in ESG or sustainability, you are sacrificing automatically uh, the financial return. If you look at it, every investment is a trade-off, yep. okay? Yep. There are no investments that have no trade-off. So it's really a matter of balancing the risk and the return. And increasingly, ESG is a de-risking. Uh, kind of mechanism. Mm. Uh, companies that do not have an ESG or, or sustainability, um, you know, um, agenda, really have a high risk in terms of their their performance, yeah. Yeah. their financial performance, and people will divest, you know, from those companies. Um, so it's really <coughs> a, a huge managing risk aspect uh, mm. that people need to look at uh, as well. Yeah. Yeah, um, well, we can go on and on about this. Right? This is a topic that we are happy with. But I think we'll wrap it up now. But I think just to, uh, <clears throat> you know, just as we are wrapping up, if, if any of the attendees have questions, please you know, use the Q&A button, ask us questions. We allocate some time to actually respond to both questions about the accelerator or questions about this fireside chat. But I think we have all hit the, the, the same points right there. You know, MES has said that there are four things that they're very focused on. One is the data piece, right? Data taxonomy. The second one is, you know, um, anti greenwashing, right? So your ability to monitor commitment, your ability to measure impact, right? That's to avoid any greenwashing. The third one is risk management. Like you said, you know, de risking, using, you know, making sure that you understand, you know, the ESG impact on your business. So where's the scenario test? The, you know, so I think every CRO right now in, 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 a, in a bank is thinking about, should I have a climate risk person you know, brought in? Because this is like a whole new, a whole new area that they've looked at and monitored. Right? So the scenarios for them is not about what happens to the bank if there's a flood, but what happens to the bank's customers if there's a flood and therefore what happens to us. Right? So I think there's a lot of those you know, uh, conversations going on. And the fourth one that was very, very interesting is how do we use technology? Right, to solve this problem. And that's why this, this year's FinTech Accelerator is really 100% focused on this green finance, green FinTech issue. Because the fourth element, which is the use, the use of technology right, to address all these problems you know, is key. Right? It's the fourth pillar in their four pillars you know, view of how they can drive this climate change program. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. And we got some interesting questions from the audience. Uh, as well. Uh, I think the first one, maybe I'll defer to the Oliver Wyman colleagues uh, to, to answer. Are all the 15 finalists <coughs> going to be present at the demo day? If I heard that correctly, whether they should be present, right, in, in person? Uh, uh, I think what they mean is going to present. Are they going to be able to, yeah. you know, to, to present a pitch at, at, the, at, at the demo day? Absolutely, absolutely. That's that's. I mean, the highlight of the whole accelerator to some extent. So yes, um, we expect to have all of the finalists there to present, uh, have a chance. It's a short presentation, so it's going to be a very short pitch to the audience and the judges. Um, and we'll be working with the fintechs to help prepare for it. Fingers crossed, the event will at least partially be in person. Let's see. But uh, um, yeah. yeah. So historically, what what um, that fifteen finalists will do on demo day is. The demo day will be during the FinTech Festival. You will actually have a different judging panel from the, the original panel of judges that you're shortlisted this 15. So this 15 judging, this, this final judges will be very senior practitioners in the market, right? And, and I think that's also a highlight to be introduced to such people uh, in, in the program. Um, and I think you know, in the past, obviously, because it was physical, there was all networking going on, right? And so people were actually literally doing potential investment fundraise during that period, right? Yeah. 
absolutely hope fingers crossed we can have it hybrid uh, because i think the engagement part is going to be quite important right ben uh, you know yeah. in, at a demo day yeah uh, there's a very interesting question tech you um you know uh do you see a future where there is a uniform esg rating on the stock market and whose responsibility is it to create it I thought we have a MSCI ESG index. We have got S and P ESG index. We actually have no lack of indexes, uh, indices. Sorry, um, you know, uh, with ESG mm -hmm. rating. Uh, uh, but I think in uh, what we are probably looking for is like a, a kind of uniform standard that investors alike can 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 trust in. Uh, that refers to the correlation between the the impact uh, and the financial performance. So yeah, there is currently no no lack of indices, but I think people like the IFRS and so on are working on some standardization uh, of uh, ESG or sustainability. So I, I think really stay tuned. Uh, exciting times ahead, and I'm sure there are a lot of people working on that. Right, Ted? You. Yeah, so I think there are two levels, right? So the MSCI, Standard & Poor's, Bloomberg, they tend to work on the very large companies, right? The large global companies, they will work on the large index stocks within your exchange. But I think what the uh, exchanges are also doing, like Singapore Stock SGX, is to also go down to those not covered by MSCI, not covered by Bloomberg. So that every listed company progressively will get rated. All right, so that so so as long as you are a a listed company, the first wave was you have to do you have to have sustainability reporting, right? Which was the you know sort of like you know two years ago people have to report what they're doing, what's the strategy and their commitments. Now the rating has gone to be more sophisticated, which is more impact based, right? What have you actually done? How much how much uh, carbon have you actually saved and so on and so forth? So I think the level of rating will get more uh, uh, sophisticated over time. That's one. The other thing that's happening is collaborations with other uh, other exchanges. Mm -hmm. So SGX has launched a, I think, a, a Nikkei-based uh, ESG index fund, right? So essentially, they're taking the, the, the Nikkei, uh, you know, listed companies that are compliant, right, and bundle it and say that, you know, for investors like insurance companies, fund managers who are trying to green their portfolio, right? You now have more options, right? So it's a bit like the legal in general in, in, in the UK. They can, they can get rid of uh, AIG, but then what, the, what do they replace AIG with, right? Because yeah. the funds that you, you, you secure when you sell, right? You have to deploy back into something. So the idea for, for most of the exchanges is to make as many of these available so the investors will find it easier to actually do that transition. It's actually interesting to see how collaboration becomes a competitive advantage that people are not looking at things very silo or they can't afford to anymore, right? So, yeah. you know, SGX would collaborate with the Nikkei Index in terms of yeah. creating this fund and there are others uh, under planning as well. Yeah. The next question is also very interesting. Uh, you know, <clears throat> thank you for the audience for that. Um, should green fintech mainly support the GHG emissions or, or reducing directly or indirectly the GHG uh, you know, emissions or carbon or, or decarbonization? Uh, I, I don't know about you, uh, Tech you, but my take on it is that ESG is much broader than just about carbon emissions and carbon footprint, environmental, social governance. And the thing is, the three are really interlocked, but the E gets a lot more attention and the E has probably a lot more investable opportunities, like in terms of funds or in terms of PE or others. But the S and the G are equally important. Like recently, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange just announced that they are demanding a gender uh, diverse board, okay? Yep. Uh, for a new listing, a new IPO yep. onto the Hong Kong EX, you must have at least one female yep. board member. Now they do allow a grace period uh, for the existing 
uh, you know, um, um, companies, list codes to comply uh, with that. But I think that's a big move in terms of, um, you know, uh, the G, the governance side. Uh, and I think the three are already interlocked. It's not just about, uh, you know, decarbonization, although that's, of course, hugely important. But it's really the whole landscape that are very often interdependent and interlocked. Right, Ted Yu? Yeah, so, so I think on... Um... The, the key is the word finance, right? So when we look at green finance, typically the fungible pro projects tend to be climate related, right? And that's why, you know, and, 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 and you know, so even to the point of looking at carbon credits, and all, there's a value attached to carbon now. Whether it's a tax or a credit, you know, we can actually make use of that to, to move the needle. I think on the broader social models, right, it becomes... Uh, a more uh, a, a softer criteria when you evaluate whether suppliers are ESG compliant or whether your investee companies, right, if your portfolio manager, right, is actually going the right direction for that. Um, those become like harder to quantify, right? So, so you can, yeah, you know, you know, so you can say, you know, uh, gender, you can put ratios to it, but you know, it's, it's, it's you take time to get to there, right? So, so people look at whether it's data as a strategy or those. But some of the social impact things where you say, you know, I help to build an orphanage, I help to build, you know, certain things, I distribute food during COVID. Those become very much social responsibility, but it's very hard to measure the impact, quantify it, and put it into, you know, a, a index, put it that way. So I think people are going towards what, what is easier to finance, what can be measured, and what is, in their mind, a little bit more time critical because, Global warming is not waiting, you know, for 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 us to solve all the problem before before they stop warming, right? So I think that's the key, right? Whereas I think the rest are less time bound, right? So so I will see that everything is important, but on the purpose of this green this global fintech accelerator, there's really a lot of focus on the financing piece. Yeah. The beauty about that accelerator is it brings together the financial institutions mm. as well as the fintechs. So yeah. I think it's through that partnership and that collaborative opportunities uh, that the next steps, the, the next actionable, you know, initiatives can be forged out, right? Yes. And, and again, if you look at the broader uh, social governance piece, uh, the previous accelerator has um, a program around financial inclusion. Right, so that was around literally, uh, you know, uh, making digital available for the underserved, right? Making you know cross-border payments cheaper, uh, more accessible. Okay, using, you know, digital KYC to and, and you know to bring down the cost of onboarding so that more and more people can be brought in. So I think there's a lot of interesting things that have been done, you know, on financial inclusion for the past past two or three years already. Right, so so I think it's not being ignored in a sense. But I think I think this year, like I said the the I would say that it's not only bringing banks and fintechs together, but it's also bringing the 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 corporates into play, right? For the first time, you know we we don't see corporates looking at this as oh this is a fintech you know banking thing we're not interested. A lot of a lot of corporates were very interested in conversations with us because they have been themselves under pressure to transition, right? They are you know their shareholders like Liga in general and other you know, shareholders like BlackRock, the market, are putting a lot of pressure on the investing companies to go green, right? And a lot of people, a lot of them are asking, you know, how do we get there? And, you know, how do we fund that transition, right? And, and I think this is where, you know, we'll bring all these problems and together and say, okay, we can do this by making sure that you have the ability, you know, to, to not just attract the capital, but also to monitor and measure impact as well. Definitely, definitely. I think that kind of wraps up the the chat, uh, you know, quite a bit. Uh, and uh, you know, it's great to see so many uh, questions uh, from the audience, uh, you know, as well. So uh, I don't know whether there are any kind of reminders or um, you know, uh, final kind of you know reinforcements uh, from Tech you or from Ben. Thank you, Yuma first, and then I'll conclude with 
uh, the presentation as a reminder of next steps? Yeah, so so I, I, I we have been doing this, uh, you know, we, 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 I've been doing a lot of these sessions nowadays, right? And I think it's always good that, you know, we get sharing in our minds. But I think um, this session is recorded, so I, I know that it's a bit late in the day, you know, uh, if you want to send this to the rest of the FinTech Association in Hong Kong, the members, right? The whole idea for us is we want to galvanize as much interest as possible because it's really a globally important topic. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you, thank you. Um, I've just flashed the page one more time here so people can see again the QR code and the link. So for, for any of you who are interested, please take a look. Um, if there are questions that we didn't answer here, you want to um, get deeper on them, by all means, reach out to us. Right? I'm sure you can find find contact details. Um, and I'm very happy to address any further questions. Hopefully look forward to receiving many applications um, in this in this FinTech Accelerator. And yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So bye-bye. <laughs>